On the banks of North Carolina There's a place that they call Chickamauga The incessant washing of the tides of time have sought to eradicate the memory of Chickamauga. Chickamauga, an important name and place in the history of North Carolina's Outer Banks. Here, brave men lived, worked, suffered, and sometimes died. Men of the life-saving service and Coast Guard bearing names like Gray, Pew, O'Neill, Etheridge, and Midget. David Stig, author and historian, explains the reason for establishing Chickamacomico and other life-saving stations. And the basic reason is the geography. We have here this long series of barrier islands uh, separated from the mainland by, by broad sounds and uh, isolated, but uh, with communities uh, spread throughout. <clears throat> and there were so many shipwrecks in the area that the residents of the communities were so often called on to effect rescues without special qualifications that the federal government decided in the 1870s that the time had come to expand their life-saving service already in service in, in New England and the Middle Atlantic states then to expand that to uh, uh, the North Carolina coast. And that was uh, the beginning of it. The centerpiece of the Outer Banks of North Carolina, of course, is Cape Hatteras. And uh, one of the big problems that the early uh, vessels had, the sail sailing vessels, was that they, uh, when they got to Cape Hatteras, coming down the coast, uh, they ran into uh, two things that made it very difficult to get around the Cape. Uh, one was the Gulf Stream, which moves uh, northward in a very steady pace and which touches the outer uh, reaches of, of uh, Diamond Shoals uh, at Cape Hatteras. The other was that the prevailing wind here is from the southwest. And there were many instances when sailing vessels uh, coming down the coast would be unable to get around the Cape. Uh, therefore, they would tack back and forth, uh, often opposite the village of Kinnikeet, and old-time Kinnikeeters uh, have, have told me of uh, times when they could see as many as 150 sails, 150 vessels tacking back and forth there, waiting for the wind to change so that they could get around the Cape. Often, when the wind changed, it changed with a vengeance. And that's when so many of the shipwrecks occurred. The vessels would uh, end up uh, cast on shore in that area north of, uh, of, of Cape Patras, which extended, of course, up as far as Chickamacomico. The Chickamacomico Life Saving Station was established in 1874 near Rodanthe on Hatteras Island. Its design was similar to other stations of the period. They were steep gabled, two-story houses measuring 20 feet by 45 feet. An open watchtower stood atop the building. The ground floor housed the surf boat, life-saving apparatus, and provided limited space for a living room and meal preparation. The second floor provided sleeping quarters for the lifesavers along with space for records, books, and necessary first aid supplies. In 1911, a new large station was constructed and the original building was moved nearby to serve as a boathouse. This outpost, having outlived its usefulness, was abandoned in 1954. Ellery C. Midget, Captain, United States Navy, retired, recalls experiences at Chickamacomico in an excerpt from a North Carolina public television documentary. The first commander of the Chickamacomico Coast Guard Station was Bannister Midget. The second one was my father, Captain John Allen Midget. And the third was also a cousin of mine, L Louvine Midget.
I was born about a half a mile from the station, right on the, on the sound side. And my father at that time was a surfman in, in the Chickamauga Coast Guard Station. As years went by, he was transferred from station to station, and he ended up being the, the keeper in charge of the Gull Shoal Station. Of course, Natcha liked all of the crew members because they were like, like a father to you in many, many ways. And uh, I remember one in particular was Clarence Midget. He was the one who went out the boat. He used to teach me about boats, go out in the boats and learn how to handle the sails. Later on, they had a motorboat. He, he taught me how to repair the engine, how to run the, run the boat. To be able to serve in, as a surfman, you really had to have a lot of stamina, physical ability, because uh, you had to walk a lot of distances through sand, and walking through sand is not like walking on a, a hard road. They have a pair of heavy boots, oil skins. You get this northeast winds blowing to the northeast. Sand cut you in the face. The uh, spray from the ocean. And if you wasn't physically able, you'd fall by the wayside. I know because I went on some of these patrols sometime, followed them in along myself as a youngster. And I couldn't keep up with them. I'd have to, I'd have to run to keep up with them while they were walking because they all seem to have long legs and take long steps. Take about two steps my one, so I know what they went through with. Up in this tower, they always kept a, a lookout 24 hours a day. Now, in addition to the lookout, of course, they had a man patrolling the beach. And they generally patrol from sunset to sunrise. And they used to have what they call a watch house about halfway between the two stations, which were about seven miles apart. A man leaving Chicken McComico Station, say on a south patrol, would, would go south to the watch house. And a man leaving the, the Gold Shoal Station, walking north, would meet at this particular watch house and exchange checks. They had to take those checks back to the station. And that by, uh, naturally, why uh, they know that the man had covered that area. Otherwise, you wouldn't know. So there's no way to get away with it. You had to, had to cover the air, regardless of the weather. 